All right, what is up guys? It is Storm here back with another video and in this one I am bringing you part 15 to the New Dawn and Naruto slash Boruto story. But before we begin, if you like the content you're seeing, be sure to subscribe, like, and comment. I mean, they're all free, so why not? If you want some dope channel merch, the link to that will be down in the description below. And if you want to see more of me, go follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well as go check out my other channels, which will all be linked down below. But without further ado, why don't we just dive right on in. Borto sighed. The land of steam was a nice country, of all the places he had been in his short life. The land of fire, water, lightning, frost, and unnamed islands dotting the oceans. It was the most beautiful, towering crags of beautiful white stone with verdant green forests. Half the land of steam was mountainous rocky terrain, the other half was thick with vegetation. But none of that was why it was Borto's favorite. It was the hot springs. Towards the north of the Land of Steam, deep in the mountains, there was a large volcano, the biggest on that continent by far. Lava tubes snaked underneath the entire country, filled with bubbling magma. They heated large underground reservoirs of water, which bubbled to the surface in the forms of hot springs. And they were heavenly. Boruto was tempted to purchase one. He had the money. Bounty hunting for the Crimson Tide had treated him well and turned him into one of the wealthiest people he personally knew. Of course, with the village's lack of bounty hunting, combined with his last year and a half of constant hunting, he was bound to make a small fortune. Borto wiggled his toes, enjoying the feel of the hot stone under them. The Hidden Steam was the single largest resort on the continent, and their hot springs were of the highest quality in all of the land. Borto thanked the gods that they were not a ninja village anymore or he would have never been able to experience them. The Hidden Steam had disbanded their military sometime after the Third War, becoming the village that had forgotten war, as someone said. Instead, they promoted themselves as a tourist destination, and after tales of their hot springs spread, they became even wealthier than when they had been a functioning ninja village. Unfortunately, Borta wasn't in the Land of Steam for pleasure. He was there for business, and nobody liked when the Crimson Tide was visiting you for business, and business was booming. The world was beginning to forget the horrors of the Fourth War, and return to their old habits. Greed. Murder. Hate. That means lots of work, including Boruto's current mission. Finding a psychopathic, sadistic murderer that had been plaguing the Land of Steam for months. Three solid months of scouring the country, and all he had to go on was vague eyewitness reports and crime scenes that were weeks old by the time he got to them. It was frustrating, to say the least. How long are you going to stew? Hikari asked, looming over Boruto as his head lolled backwards. Opening one eye, he saw her looking down at him with the same cold, impatient eyes as always. It's not like we're going to find this guy anyway, Boruto chirped, closing his eyes and enjoying the hot spring. We definitely won't if you keep blazing about, Hikari countered. Boruto made a small noise of disagreement. Hikari pointed her finger at the water and let a bolt of lightning arc between them. The water crackled with electricity, but Boruto didn't even seem phased. That actually felt pretty good, Borto commented, sinking lower into the water. Hikari made a noise of disappointment in the back of her throat. She didn't expect him to be hurt, let alone injured, by her lightning, but it still annoyed her that he shrugged it off so easily. The nickname she made for him on impulse, half a pun in his name, had turned out to be surprisingly fitting. Inazuma, lightning bolt. Just hurry up, she commanded. Borto hummed and nodded. It was a few weeks after his 15th birthday, and given that he hadn't been able to celebrate at the time, annoying cloud ninjas, Boruto was milking their current mission for all it was worth. Boruto to bite his tongue to stifle a laugh as other customers filtered in, bewildering looking men with wide eyes in the wake of having a woman in their half of the hot spring. Boruto huffed and got out of the hot spring, making sure to dissipate the electrical charge in the pool. Don't want some unsuspecting civilian to get the shock of their life. He dressed in common worn clothes. Neither he nor Hikari dressed in their combat fatigues or wore their headbands. On the run murderers were usually in the watch for ninjas. They never expected the man and woman dressed like they had just finished a hard day's work. The rough fabric never ceased to irritate Boruto. It wasn't a high quality designer fabric like the clothes he had become accustomed to wearing. And it didn't allow the freedom of movement his combat fatigues offered. In a word, annoying. Hikari seemed to know he'd be along shortly, as she was waiting for him outside the dressing room. Ah, <sighs> alright, Borta sighed. Let's go. She practically dragged him out of the bathhouse before Bor took a change his mind. The two of them wandered the streets of the Hidden Steam, keeping their ears open for any ill-spoken gossip. They frequented bars and tea houses and small food vendors. It was amazing how much you could learn from the common people's gossip. They might not know they were talking about sensitive information, but to a ninja, even the smallest hint was enough to track their prey. 
Ironically, the information came to them. A short, balding man approached them in the street, blocking their path. He eyed Boruto and Akari warily, his beady eyes flickering between them. Judging them to be the pair he was looking for, he handed them a sealed scroll and bowed respectively before scurrying off. Boruto handed the scroll to Akari, who read as they continued to roam the streets. This way, Hikari called, tugging at the sleeve of Boruto's shirt. Boruto watched as she scrutinized the map and weed between alleys and worn dirt paths that led deeper into the city, away from the tourist trap and into the suburbs. They eventually found their way to a house with broken windows that was surrounded by men in uniform. They wore a band around their upper arms with the character for steam emblazoned in red stitching. The Land of Steam's secret police, who answered only to the Steam Lord himself. At their approach, one of them stifened and saluted. Lieutenants Hikari and Inazuma, he greeted respectfully. Boruto instantly liked the man, addressing him by rank. Good first impression. He used his nickname in lieu of his given name. Too many wanted posters with his real name had been spread around the continent. Pretty much everyone knew that Okage's errant son was somewhere in the Land of Water vicinity. It was the worst kept secret in the East. What's the situation? Hikari asked, nodding in her own small recognition of who Boruto assumed was the captain of the squad. Five victims. This is a description of the other crime scenes. We were just informed hours ago by a report. The neighbors hadn't seen them for days, the captain told them. Borta sniffed the air and could smell the metallic tang of blood. Hikari nodded and strode forward. The police guarding the house parted, allowing them entrance. Boruto followed close behind, and even after two years of grizzled service with the Crimson Tide, he still balked as he entered the bloody, ransacked home. A middle-aged man and woman were on display, prominently in the center of the living room. Both had been stripped naked and systematically dissected. The man's chest was wide open. A cut from both shoulders meeting in the center of his chest before heading south had opened his chest cavity wide. His innards had pulled in the ground before him. His face locked in a horrific expression of agony and terror. The woman was worse. Her belly was mangled and sliced in so many places that there was nothing but a meaty pulp left. Her intestines had been roughly thrown to the side of her body, sliced in two almost as if someone had been digging through her. A meaty sack was left lying on the ground before the woman's knees. Boruto didn't want to think of what it was. Fuck, Boruto swore. Hikari was nodding slowly next to him. That isn't all, the captain said from behind them. Boruto hadn't even heard the man follow them. And still, it got worse. The captain had said there were five victims, and so there were. Three small bodies, hardly recognizable as human, were huddled in a corner of the kitchen. Children, no older than six or seven. Borta felt something vile bubble in his gut. He held a hand to his stomach and willed it to settle. Wouldn't do any good to vomit on the crime scene. It was at times like these, rare as they were, that Borta thanked the gods his partner was Akari. She had a way of taking command of hard situations that sheltered him from some of the more gruesome facets of their work. Blood trail leads from the living room to the kitchen. Indicating that parents were killed first, she said, following the practical river of dried blood on the floor. Children hid in the corner. Assailant killed them in a single swing, she continued on, pointing to the single long gash in the wood of the cabinets that matched up, roughly, with the bisected corpses, staying only long enough to brutally mutilate their bodies, Hikari said, turning away from the children. Return to the living room, she said. Following the fresh trail of blood could indicate the parents were still alive, merely wounded. He returned to finish the job. Probably silenced the kids, the captain offered. Their crying could have annoyed him or drawn attention from the neighbors. That was a disturbing thought. Hikari nodded she knelt to inspect the bodies of the man and woman. The woman was killed first. The rest of the body is in relatively good condition. Assailant cut his way through her abdomen and intestines before removing her uterus, she said. The man was killed last. His expression could be from watching his wife be killed. These cuts are similar to the ones used for autopsies, could indicate a degree of medical knowledge. Judging by the degree of decomposition and the appearance of the blood, these killings could have been reformed anywhere between 7 and 10 days ago, Hikari summarized. Borto shivered. A combination of the gruesome nature of the civilian deaths, and the blatant display of the Mist Hunter Ninja's training. Why the Mist needed such thorough training in an era of peace was beyond Boruto's understanding. Hikari couldn't have been older than him by a year or two, three if he was really pushing it, and she knew things no one his age should ever know. The captain nodded slowly, his eyes roaming the room but never settling in the bodies. Can you find him? The Steam Lore grows weary of these killings. 
As I'm sure you can understand, the captain nodded. Hikari nodded. This is the first crime scene we've managed to catch in such a small time frame between killings, she said. He couldn't have gone far. We'll find him. The captain looked relieved and quickly shut them out. Just as they were about to close the door, Bordo saw something out of the corner of his eye. Wait, Bordo said. Walking back to the living room, he crouched resting on the balls of his feet. Look, he said, pointing at the floor. Hikari crouched next to him. Bowing her head to look at the correct angle, it was faint, barely recognizable, but it was there, underneath the blood, or perhaps in the blood, was a crudely drawn symbol. A circle with an upside-down triangle, Borto half-stated, half-questioned. Correct, the car confirmed. Good eyes. This hasn't been at any of the other crime scenes. That or we didn't notice it. Which was fair, there was a lot of blood. A symbol drawn in the blood would have been hard to find. What do you think it is? Bordo asked. That is what we were paid to find out, Hikari told them, both quickly leaving the house. While they had investigated the bodies, more police had arrived. A squadron of men filtered in the body with body bags and copious amounts of water and soap. Bordo didn't envy their job. Bordo sighed heavily. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight, he commented. That kind of cruelty had a way of burning itself into your mind, whether you wanted it to or not. Hikari grabbed his sleeve and pulled him down the street, opposite the way they came. Behind us, she whispered. Alley between the two houses. Eight o'clock. Borto's cerulean eyes faded to a pale violet as his Byakugan manifested. In an instant, they had found their target. A man stood in the shadows between the two houses, watching the police go about their work with a wide smile adorning his features. Male. Aged between 20 and 30. Brown eyes. Dull gray hair. Died, possibly, or chakra manipulation, Borto whispered. Chakra pathway system indicates he has some form of training. Three straight knives, one in his boot, one in his waist, and one in his jacket sleeve. Hikari's eyes narrowed. On three, she whispered back. On the third count, both of them turned on their heels and thundered down the street. The stone beneath their boots cracked from the force of their chakra enhanced speed. Borto saw the man's eyes widen in surprise before he turned and fled down the alleyway. Borto leapt to the rooftops with Hikari not far behind. Like a cat stalking a mouse in the grass, they hunted the man. He wove through the hidden steam with familiar ease at a pace that even ninjas would have trouble matching. But before Borto's eyes, there was no escape. Borto could hear the man's furious panting as he gasped for breath. The man must have realized that escape was futile, for he kept looking skyward. Each time he saw Borto on the rooftop, not even a few feet behind him, his eyes were wide with fear. Eventually, his path began to take him to the outskirts of the village. Hikari leapt through the air and sent a barrage of throwing needles hissing through the alleyway, cutting off his path of escape. In a desperate attempt to flee, the man leapt through a window and burst to the front door of a couple's home. He sprinted through the streets and found himself cornered on a rocky crag overlooking the forest far below. A low fence was all that separated him from certain death. Surrender, Hikari barked, three needles in both hands. Borto had worked with her long enough to know that they would paralyze the man in an instant with their toxins. The gray-haired man turned to face them, a look of wild bloodlust in his eyes. He reached for the knives in his sleeve and at his waist, drawing them. Hikari's eyes narrowed as she threw her needles. Surprisingly, the man weaved through all six without a scratch and charged at them, screaming maniacally. For Lord Joshin, he howled. Borto was a blur as he darted forward. He struck the man in the chest four times before he could blink, blocking the first and second coronary chakra points as well as the two primary preliminary chakra points. The man dropped like a puppet with its strings cut. He laid on the ground, face down, struggling to even breathe. The way his heart struggled to beat probably didn't help things much. When you combine the gentle fist with the utilitarian medical knowledge taught to mist hunter ninjas, it's was a deadly combination. Those lessons had been particularly helpful in advancing and refining Borto's taijutsu. Borto grinned in satisfaction as Hikari knelt and plunged a number of needles into the man's pressure points. He howled in pain for a moment before descending into a mad, raving laughter and moans of pleasure. Who are you? Did you kill those people? Do you know who did? Hikari hissed. The man continued to cackle, not answering the question. Despite the copious amount of drugs flowing through his system, Hikari withdrew another needle and stabbed him in the neck. The man's crackling turned to a gurgling, as he drooled and struggled to form conscious thoughts. Who are you? Did you kill those people? Do you know who did? Hikari repeated. Lord Joshin, I give you these sacrifices. The man managed to slur. Borto grabbed Hikari by the collar and hurled her backwards, as he leapt away from the man. His body exploded in the thunderous boom of light and heat that scorched Borto's skin. 
The only thing left was a charred lump of flesh and scorch marks on the stone. Damn, Borta swore. Swallowed explosive tags. Hikari appeared next to him and helped Borta to his feet. It wasn't a complete loss. That man was either the killer or knew the killer. Now we have a new avenue to investigate, she said. Borta raised an eyebrow and asked who this Lord Joshin is. She answered the unspoken question. Naruto suppressed the urge to fidget in his seat. He sat next to a very stony-faced Gara, and opposite of an emotionless Tsuchikage. Neither was acknowledging the other. Hell, they refused to even admit they were in the same room together. Just one of the many things that annual Kage Summit were good for, easing the tension. Especially when skirmishes over borders were involved, Naruto didn't even know why either country cared. The border between the land of wind and earth was nothing but rugged mountains. There were no places to farm or settle, and the only worth in the land itself was in mines that had long ago been stripped and stripped again. The five great nations may have been young, but people had been living on the continent for thousands of years. The mines were practically dry that far up in the mountains. It started with a few heated words between border patrols, before descending into small fights between a squad or two. When word reached their respective leaders, both Kara and Kurotsuchi had sent more men to reinforce the border. That only escalated things. That wasn't the worst part either. There had been many summits over the years, but not once had any of the Kage brought bodyguards. This year, they had. It spoke volumes of the current state of peace. A tense conqueror and Tamari stood behind Gara, their backs straight and their gazes boring into the wall. Akatsuchi and another Jonin from the Hidden Rock stood behind Kurotsuji. Of course, when everyone learned that the Kazakage and Tsuchikage were feuding, the rest also brought their own guards. That was how Naruto found himself seated in a small room at an even smaller table, with a tense atmosphere with his and Sasuke's daughters looming behind him. Both had practically demanded to be allowed to guard him, and when your angry daughter kicks down your office door, Byakugan piercing your soul and Rasengan clutching the palm of her hand, you agreed. Naruto had been regretting his decision to train Himawari and Sarada, but he just couldn't get work done with the two of them pestering him all day. Then they started to get violent. The first time Himawari had slipped and knocked his mountain of papers over, it had been an accident. The second time, a coincidence. The third and fourth times, Naruto knew when to surrender, begrudgingly teaching them both a few things here and there. His paperwork was blissfully undisturbed from that day forward. So, Darui said, breaking the ice. Can you two kids play nice? Or not, Naruto thought. Gara was as stony-faced as ever, but Kurosuchi scowled. Watch your tongue, Raikage, she snapped. Now, now, Naruto tried. It only served to have the anger of the entire room focus on him. He quickly shut his loud mouth before it could even get him in trouble. It didn't help that everyone knew he was on Gara's side. The two of them were close friends, and their countries were staunch allies ever since the end of the Fourth War. We've had peace for nearly 20 years, and you two are going to ruin it over a bunch of rocks? Darui questioned the two of them. Even Gara frowned at that. His country might be a desert wasteland, but still, it was his country. He loved it. The sand invaded our territory. We responded in kind. Kurtsuji declared. The rock attacked our border patrol. Unprovoked, Gara countered. And whose fault is that? Kurtsuji asked. You received the same mission report I did. The sand taunted my men. I hardly call that unprovoked. They can't be blamed for their actions. We are not strangers to pre-battle banter, Gara chided. That is not an excuse to attack my men. Both look ready to jump the table and do battle right there. Naruto decided to nip that conflict in the bud. He allowed the smallest fraction of Kurama's chakra to flood his system. A few incorporeal flickers of orange-yellow chakra drifting off him. We can settle this peacefully, he stated. It wasn't a question, or an option. He wouldn't let them fight. It was too soon for the peace he and everyone had fought and bled for, and... Gara settled into his usual stony mask and Kurosuchi scowled, but neither continued trading verbal blows. Naruto felt a little bad about playing the Kurama card, but if it prevented wars, he'd use it. He didn't like to loom over the other nations with his power. The only other country who had a tail beast was the Cloud, and even then, the Eight Tails was weaker than him alone. With Sasuke, there wasn't a force alive who could match the leave. Looking between the two, Naruto could tell they wouldn't be able to hash it out on their own. He sighed. Why don't both of you start by withdrawing your reinforcements from the border and telling your men to stand down, he suggested. Neither of you want a war. I know that. Gara nodded after a few moments of consideration. The Tsuchikage rolled her eyes but agreed. See, that wasn't so hard, Naruto said with a bright smile, trying to lighten the tension. Darui made a quiet noise that Naruto thought might have been a scoff. We have other problems as well, Chajura spoke up. The mercenaries are running rampant, not just in the land of water, but every country. 
Our stance on missions is driving people to them in droves. If we don't do something, we'll begin to face mercenary companies whose strength rivals our own. Darwi nodded. I've had my Anbu hunting down any who trespass in the land of lightning, but we've met with little success, he said. This subject, in particular, set Naruto on edge. Technically, Borto was missing. He had forgotten to inform his allies that he was, in fact, not missing, but part of one of the same mercenary groups that was causing trouble. So far, Sai and his team had managed to keep him relatively safe by throwing off the other Anbu tracking him, but there was only so much he could do. We can't start taking those kinds of requests again, Gar said, cutting off the Mitsukage. When we formed the Shinobi Union, we decided that they promoted war, he reminded everyone. War between us, Darui stated but not war between us and upstart mercenaries in smaller villages. You know as well as I do that grass, waterfall, sound, and frost are all rebuilding or recruiting for their own ninja corps. Naruto sighed. I don't think we should consider taking assassination and espionage missions, he said firmly. Everyone listened when the Okage talked, but we can make a show of force. Show the world that the five great nations aren't resting on their laurels. What do you have in mind? Kurotsuchi asked. Naruto grinned. You see, it's like the Chunin exams, except for every nation. Instead of competing for ranks, we compete simply to see who's better, he said. Taijutsu, Ninjutsu, Genjutsu, all the ninja arts. Only the best are recognized. It's a competition, Gar stated. Only the winners get global recognition, and by extension, their village. Interesting. It could work, Chojo thought aloud. And it will let our men blow off some steam, Kurotsuji said. Everyone nodded. Ninja were born and bred for war. The extended peace was starting to make them restless. Restless men and women who could burn houses down by exhaling was never a good thing. All in favor? Naruto asked. Everyone raised their hand. 